Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. The end of Friedrich Nietzsche's essay on truth and lying in an extramoral sense is taken up by sketching out this clash between the what he calls the intuitive person and the rational person. And he sees this as a particularly modern, uh, late modern conflict, something that we are facing in our own time. Uh, and the entire, you know, section two, which is a short section, uh, bringing this to a close, is concerned with this. Now, Nietzsche begins by talking about the human drive or, or desire is how it's also translated here. Fundamental desire. Trieb in German has this, you know, Im, sort of impulse, pushing forward, driving forward. It's not just desiring in a sort of static way of, oh, I hope I get something. It's, it's moving out towards it. Um, so this, he says, this is a basic drive to form metaphors. It's a fundamental desire in human beings. We, we cannot really eliminate this. Even though we live in highly rationalized societies, even if they strike us as irrational, the very criterion by which we talk about their irrationality is often hyper-rational from Nietzsche's perspective. It's done with concepts. We expect things to remain the same. We talk about science and laws of nature. We have forgotten the metaphors that we have used to, to create an entire world. And he talks about living in a kind of prison, that, uh, which is of our own construction, a uh, prison of concepts, of schemata. Even despite that, this drive for metaphor pushes through. It, it, it can't be eliminated. Uh, so long as there are human beings, there's always going to be somebody messing around with it. Nietzsche is, in a certain respect, the, the uh, admirer and the advocate of the one who subverts, who, who uh, goes beyond the, the rules and the hierarchies and the structures and doesn't necessarily get rid of them, uh, but imposes new forms as well. So he, he says that, you know, science is working at this, what he calls great columbarium of the concept, uh, the sepulcher of intuition where it's going to die, right? Forever constructing higher and higher levels. And yet intuition and myth, art, metaphor, all of those things are going to still be with us. Sometimes they'll be repressed. Sometimes they'll be dismissed, belittled even turned into, as we might say in our own time, commodities. But they're always going to escape this, what he called columbarium or his, his prison house, as he, he's called it in other places. So he says, this drive uh, cannot be discounted for one moment because that would amount to ignoring man himself. Now, does he mean by this, that, um, you know, in the beginning we had the metaphor and then we developed something better. We're sort of, you know, this, this upward movement throughout history, developing further and further and further. That is not what Nietzsche is saying here. He's talking about the capacity to break through at any given time. So he says that we're not... Uh, you know, restrained by the fact that out of our diminished product, the concepts, a regular and rigid world is built up for him as a prison fortress. It, this drive, seeks a new province for its activities and a different riverbed is the metaphor here. We, we could say it finds new outlets. 
It finds new ways to express itself and not just to express itself as something that's, you know, in the background and it has to find a nice way to make everyone know what's going on. No, expressing itself in this case, uh, having an outlet in this case means where it can develop itself, where it can be active. So where does it, it do that? In myth and in art. Now, what is Nietzsche talking about here historically? We said, well, we're talking about our own time. He's going to shoot this backwards into ancient Greece as well. Myth is something that comes on the scene. And so does epic poetry, art. When you've got this entire structure of schemata that's set out, when you have a rational uh uh, you know, set of associations, metaphors that were originally metaphors, vivid, but have lost that, that vivacity and have now become merely, uh, you know, structures or schemas or ways in which we, we share a common language. That, well, that happened very early on. And yet at every point, myth and art were there to turn things topsy-turvy. And it continues on in the present today. We have myths ourselves here and now. We have things that we believe in and get all jazzed up about and find meaning in uh, when, when we don't find it in this, this rational structure. And art is still taking place. Not necessarily in the art schools, not necessarily in the art museums, although you can go to those and certainly see some cool things, but perhaps in other ways as well. So he goes on and he says, uh, this drive constantly confuses the categories and cells of the concepts by presenting new transferences, metaphors, and metonyms, constantly showing the desire to shape the existing world of the wide awake person to be variegatedly irregular and disinterestedly incoherent, exciting and eternally new, like the world of dreams. Well, what do you think it is when we watch a movie and we're like, oh my God, that's an experience. Not just, oh yeah, action movie, I know what's going to happen over there. Rom-com, I know what's going to happen over there. You know, I've got the code down. But when something new happens, when we listen to music, and we are surprised by the reinterpretation of old motifs. Or when we listen again to the old music with new ears. All of these are possibilities for us. When we write poetry to each other, and we're not just doing it to impress each other in cafes or you know, to satisfy a requirement in a class, but we're trying to forge new meaning. This is what Nietzsche is talking about here. So there's a desire to, to reshape, to subvert, to confuse, to blend together, to rework, to make irregular, to reintroduce affectivity, desire, all of these sorts of things that stand a risk of being lost. So he goes on and he says... Um, we have this unconquerable tendency to let ourselves be deceived. And uh, he is as if in, enchanted with happiness when the rhapsodist, who's the rhapsodist? The rhapsodist was the interpreter of the traditional poetry. You would go from city to city and interpret Homer. You would, you would say the rhymes, right? Because Homer was, of course, poetry. And then you might explain it and interpret it. And you would put your own spin on it. Likewise, the, the, the actors in the play and the tragedies and comedies and satyr plays uh, are reinterpreting things for us. Who are the rhapsodists of our time? That is a question that we have to think about. Who is, is the person that we would identify with what Nietzsche is talking about here as happening in ancient Greece and in, in Rome? And now notice that he's talking here also about another key thing that we began uh, looking at early on in the essay, this dissimulation and deception that takes place that Nietzsche sees as 
<clears throat> at the very root of the human intellect. It's also involved in art. And the question is not whether we're going to have dissimulation, but what kind is it going to be? Is it going to be dissimulation that conceals from us that dissimulation is taking place? Or is it going to be more honest? Is it going to be engaging in the dissimulation and inviting us to join in, at least by apprehending it and responding to it? He talks about here, um, as long as it can deceive without harm, the intellect, that master of deception, is free and released from its usual servile tasks. And that is when it celebrates its Saturnalia. Saturnalia is a holiday where everything is turned upside down and you have a great time. He says, never is it more luxuriant, richer, prouder, more skillful and bold. The poet, the interpreter of the poet, uh, the rhapsodist, is able to take the, the human intellect and turn it to this, this you know, capacity that it has for creating metaphors, for reworking metaphors, for coming up with something new. And he does that, and people are pleased by it. Now, they're pleased by it because it's art, and, and art, in a certain sense, is you know, like a, a leisure time activity. It's, it's not real life. It's, it's something different. But it can start to absorb more and more and more. So he goes on, and he, he tells us, look, everything contains dissimulation. It's, it's whether we have the dissimulation involved in art or we have the dissimulation involved in the ghostly schemata of abstractions, the, the prison house, the columbarium. And here he starts talking about how the artist and a certain kind of person of, you know, in our own time takes guidance no longer from concepts as such, but from intuitions. And this requires a little bit of explanation. When we see this word intuition, we often associate it with like, oh, a gut feeling or, you know, I put my intellect aside and I just go with, you know, my intuition. Intuitions here is in the plural. One has intuitions and they could be at war with each other. They may require some thinking out. They have to be, if not reconciled, at least brought into some sort of dynamic tension with each other so that they can occupy the stage at the same time. And Nietzsche is telling us that, that this is something that was going on within ancient Greece, which are the people that he looks to uh, quite a lot. He says, there are ages in which the rational man and the intuitive man stand by, side by side. One in fear of intuition. The rational person fears intuition. It's irrational. It's ungrounded. It's unsafe. How do I know that it's actually going to work out the way it's supposed to work out? It, you know, it doesn't fit the code. The intuitive person, he says, with mockery of a, for abstraction. Both, he says, desire to master life. One, by managing to meet his main needs with foresight, prudence, reliability. The other, as the overjoyous hero. So we have two different responses to the problem of life. Both of them actually do use the intellect, but one of them uses the intellect uh, in a metaphorical way, in a productive way. The other uses it in a way that's sort of laid out in advance, and you can, you can proceed along with you know crunching new numbers, you could say, generating new code, replicating the same and the same and the same. And isn't that boring, ultimately? The, the side of interest for Nietzsche lies with the intuitive person. Notice that both of them are engaged in dissimulation. Both of them are changing the world in a certain way. Both of them are doing so in an anthropomorphic way. The question is, which of them is going to... Uh, prevail in, in modernity, in which we're going ourselves to align with. He talks here about the Greeks, and again, he says that they, they uh, uh, could do a playing with serious matter when the man guided by concepts and abstractions merely wards off misfortune without extracting happiness for himself. Uh, then the intuitive man standing in the midst of culture, in addition to warding off harm, 
reaps from his intuitions a continuously streaming clarification, cheerfulness, redemption. You see which side Nietzsche is on, the side of the intuitive person, very clearly. He contrasts to that what he actually calls the stoic, we could say lowercase person, who is seeking, you know, uh, honesty, truth, freedom from delusions, and protection from enthralling seizures. Nietzsche is saying that's never really going to be possible. The way forward for Nietzsche is with the intuitive person who works by way of metaphor and through myth and art. 